Hello and welcome back to Looking Forward, a weekly podcast of debate and discussion about politics and ideas. Today, it appears we've reached a turning point in the COVID crisis. The old plans have been tried, they've sometimes failed, they've sometimes worked, but it's definitely time for something new. Unfortunately, our governments haven't got the message. They're still stuck in delusional plans, waiting for vaccines, or they think we can extend lockdowns forever. They even think that lockdowns work. Go figure. So we'll be talking all about that, not just in respect to Victoria and Australia, uh, but uh, many other issues as well. We'll be taking a look behind the scenes and talking about some of the conflicting expert advice, which really does cast doubt on everything governments are saying about what we should do from here on in. To, to have this discussion, I'm delighted to, first of all, welcome my co-host from RMIT University, Dr. Chris Berg. Thank you, Scott. Chris, great to have you. And a special treat today for looking forward, listeners, none other than Gideon Rosner, Director of Policy at the Institute of Public Affairs, and also, of course, the host of our newest podcast product, which is the IPA with you. Gideon, welcome. Th uh, well, thank you, Scott. That was a very, very kind introduction, and uh, it's a special treat for me too, because I get to leave the house with my <laughs> issued work permit. <laughs> That's right. And uh, you, you, you've it's got a red letter day. Got to, got to rush home immediately afterwards. Yes, yes. <sighs> it's what, what am I going to go? What am I going to do? Go to the pub? <laughs> no, heaven, well, not. None are open. So there we go. Um, uh, and don't forget, this is a product of the Institute of Public Affairs. If you're not already a member, please do go to our website, see how you can join or donate. And if you're listening to this as a podcast, don't forget you have the opportunity to leave a review. Please do make it a good one. We haven't, uh, we've had very few negative reviews, but we haven't had many of any description lately. So please do get around some of that tech and tell us what a tremendous job we're doing. Just saying. Chris Berg, some scenarios, please, on how is uh, the next phase of the corona crisis going to play itself out? Thank you, Scott. So um, uh, as listeners may know, last week, Scott Morrison announced a deal with a company called AstraZeneca to manufacture and supply um, the a COVID-19 vaccine, the one that's been developed by Oxford University to every Australian for free, um, we can talk a little bit about the circumstances in which we would be uh, offered or required to take that vaccine. Um, but it really brings to the forefront the thing that everybody seems to be have, uh, holding on to since this crisis began, and that's the possibility that there could be a vaccine. And once there's a vaccine, the suggestion is, or the, the hope is that, you know, COVID goes away, or at least stops becoming a, a real concern. Um, Gideon, I want to first ask you about the political significance of a vaccine. It seems to have become such a, um, it, it, it seems to have become so fundamental to our hopes about what's next in this crisis. Um, there's a lot riding us on this, isn't there? There is. Um and I don't think necessarily for ordinary people or for the population. Uh, I'm sceptical about a vaccine. I, I'm getting outside my comfort zone in terms of my expertise, but they've never been able to cure a coronavirus as far as I'm aware. Uh, this vaccine has been tested on a thousand people healthy with between the ages of 18 and 55. It's uh, it, all they've proven so far is that there are no side effects and that it triggers some sort of immune response. We don't know if it actually is effective in warding off infection, especially in more vulnerable people who, uh, you know, disproportionately suffer from this already. The political significance of it, therefore, to me, it is that the governments, state, federal, internationally, they have made they have built the coronavirus up into such a catastrophic, fear-inducing, life-or-death disease, and that, that's not me saying it's not serious, it absolutely is serious, but I think there's been a lot of political hype layered on top of that, that they have mandated lockdowns and border closures and all sorts of things that are becoming deeply, deeply unpopular. They can't abandon those measures because they've sworn black and blue that they're necessary as terrible as they are, so to me, this vaccine is a political out. To me, this is saying, you know, it's giving people a bit of good news. I think that there's a hope that uh, it will trigger some sort of debate between anti-vaxxers and, and sceptics and, and, and others about the, a mandatory mass, uh, the, the mandatory nature of it and everything else. 
I, yeah. I, I think it's a bit of a fig leaf, to be perfectly yeah. honest with and, you. And Chris, I know you got more questions backed up. I just wanted to, to say, of course, um, I mean, politicians everywhere are, are grasping for this vaccine. But um, as we've emphasised time and time again on this podcast, um, Australia is in this unique situation, perhaps only with New Zealand, does it mean so much? So uh, AstraZeneca is developing this vaccine in the UK. Now, in the UK at the moment, they have, are having fewer daily deaths from COVID-19 than we are seeing in Victoria. So for all of uh, you know, the hash that they, they completely made of it um, you know, in the UK, the fact is, uh, to the extent that uh, viruses, pandemics you know, have a pattern... Uh, it's pretty clear that the UK, for example, and many other countries are at the other side of that curve, if you like, this famous curve that we were trying to flatten. So ironically, the home of this vaccine being developed, um, by the time it arrives, will not be uh, relevant for probably 50% of the population. It's only in Australia and New Zealand that everything hinges on it. That's an amazing load to, to put on something that uh, in the ordinary course of events... Uh, would take years to trial, um, and as Gideon said, they've never actually managed to do it uh, before. Yeah, I, th I think that's right. And in Australia, we've um, decided, or the policymakers have decided on our behalf, that unless there is a virtual elimination, not full elimination, but virtually eliminated, say, less than three or four per day, then we cannot let up on um, uh, our lockdown policies and so forth. And we're waiting for a vaccine to break that cycle. That, that, that appears to be the policy position of all Australian governments. Now, I think that is a reckless public policy decision. Mm. I think that is, um, uh, is, is laying a trap for us. And, and we're now finding, what it, finding out what it's like to be in that trap. We first started talking about this, Scott, as you know, in January, it's now August, and we're in still in Melbourne at least lockdown because it's this is just a really hard virus to eliminate it's it is um very hard to predict where it's going to go so the vaccine turns out is incredibly important in Australia it's important around the world but from a policy perspective it's really important in Australia which leads us to um the first of the many vaccine-related public policy questions I think we're going to be dealing with mm. until um certainly all the way through 2021, which is, well, should you be required to take that vaccine? So Scott Morrison, and I'll, I'll quote him exactly. Scott Morrison um, uh, last week, I think it was, uh, was asked whether the vaccine should be mandatory or compulsory. And the phrase that he said was, as mandatory as we can make it. Um, he then walked back those comments because there was an understandable uproar. Um, by saying, well, there are no compulsory vaccines in Australia. This one would not be compulsory. Um, uh, Gideon, I'm going to ask you what you think about this, but I am mm. going to quickly give it a little bit of a frame in that um, there's an assessment uh, coming out of actually um, the United States that for a vaccine to be effective in offering herd immunity, we would probably need about 80% of a population to take that vaccine. Hmm. So given that frame, how do you respond to Morrison's up and back comments on, on compulsory nature of vaccination? Well, look, taking a step back and going back to your earlier question about the politics of it, um, the problem with this is that vaccinations and more importantly, the compulsory nature of vaccinations uh, or government mandates over vaccinations is an extremely politically loaded topic. Uh, the fact that we've had bogus theories of um, the measles, mumps, rubella vaccine causing autism, for example, means that any discussion of a, of a vaccine will immediately trigger the standoff between uh, you know, people who are inclined to say it should be mandatory and, and, uh, and they have a weapon, I guess, to use against people who are sceptical by calling them anti-vaxxers and all sorts of other things. Um, fundamentally, I think I'll answer your question with a sort of a question. It's a very, very vexed issue. That's the best way to answer a question, Gideon, I find. Is it really? Um, <laughs> see what I did there? No. Um, uh, so it's a very good question, Chris, and one that I've been pondering. Yeah. It's, it's always a good response. Well, it's, it's something that I have. I still ponder. I mean, But, but it's amazingly ham-fisted from Morrison, really. For a professional politician, 
He knows uh, what he's doing. Mean, well, that's the thing. Does he know what he's doing? No, I, 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 I don't think he did. The I, conspiracy I, I, theory I, I, in, I, serious I, in me is saying he's deliberately trying to start a bit of street theatre uh, no, and, and, and I, which, I, which anti-vaxxers and no, people No, this like is that. classic swamp stuff. This is inside the bubble. Yeah. He actually said, you know, you know, while I address this issue as, as health minister and – uh, and he did, and it's through nudging, as he says. You know, there's no such thing as a compulsory vaccine, but, you know, uh, welfare benefits, other benefits can be withheld um, if you refuse immunisation of your children, and yeah. which uh, personally I think is, is not complete, is not unreasonable. No, it, likewise. For, I for those kind of vaccines. Yeah, um, because there's a harm principle involved, and that's what I'm saying. It's a vexed issue for libertarians, but I've always, I've always, I've supported notionally no jab, no play, because yeah, but, you can infect not only your own child but other children too young to be immunised. Absolutely, but but here we have the additional factor that we're talking but this about. This is a different situation. Well, it's a different situation because we're not talking about proven vaccines over which we have enormous amounts of data about their 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 side effects and the one you know the one in a. 100,000 cases. I know my brother's listening to this. He told me 40 years ago, he said, the thing about vaccines is if you're the one in a thousand cases, you should be given a lifetime pension by the, by the government because mm. you, you, you were the unlucky one who bore the risk of, um, or it's probably one in a hundred thousand of an adverse reaction because you need everyone to have confidence in that process. Mm. So given all of those well, sensitivities... Well, we're printing what, money like it's going out of fashion. Sure, give them a pension. Yeah, what, what the hell does it matter well, well, no, well, we've got four million on JobKeeper. So, um, but yeah, the, keep the, them there. The no, I, I just think it was amazingly money. ham-fisted of Morrison to, to just walk straight into that yeah. and then have to walk it back. But if you were Morrison, I mean, I guess you're the political calculus is as follows. But the, the polls, which I don't believe, by the way, are saying that everybody is overwhelmingly in agreement with uh, lockdowns and, and similar measures... Uh, authoritarianism seems to be popular with the people. I don't think it is. I think there's a shy Tory effect and people aren't comfortable speaking out against the coronavirus lockdown measures to some mm. pollster who calls them up on the telephone at night. Um, so, well, I mean... But uh, I hope you're right, but fear is a powerful motivator. It absolutely as you is. Said, as you said right at the start, there's been nothing but fear in, yeah. in all of the communications around coronavirus. Correct. And now Daniel Andrews is running ads around the clock with survivors saying, you know, it'll scar your lungs and so on. Now, no doubt it can, but this is this is just... This is just the, the, the political deployment it, of fear. Now, anyway, so getting back to vaccines, uh, look, I, look, I think there'll be a strong incentive to take it anyway. There are a lot of people who are wary about new vaccines just because you know the uh, MMR autism link is complete you know hogwash that doesn't mean that we should forget about things like thalidomide and other things I can't pronounce um, but look to be perfectly brutal and to get very very dark here I'll be the first to line up to take the bloody vaccine well, because anything would be better than living like this and I hope there are side effects in many ways I hope it does knock me off well Chris isn't that exactly what we said uh, a couple of months ago about the the COVID safe app which we knew was bogus but it was it well, was, it was performative. <laughs> we, well, we knew it was bogus at the time. It was completely performative. It gave the government an excuse to lower restrictions. Correct. And the it vaccine was right. exactly right. the same. Um, and and to, to a theme that we've touched on, um, the Brookings Institute had a really interesting idea, which is that you don't make the vaccine compulsory. You actually incentivize people to take the vaccine. So what happens, and they were talking about the United States, obviously, um, what happens if we gave everybody a thousand dollars if they took the vaccine? Now, given the incredible amount of money that we are spending locking down the economy, particularly the United States, of course, um, uh, the incredible economic damage that we're doing, the incredible deficits that that we have, then that seems like a pretty sensible solution, <laughs> even though it's you... incredibly expensive and would be oh, a it's, it's, um, extraordinary piece of policy in normal times. Well, when you got it's a pocket point. change compared to JobKeeper, but Chris, don't you foresee somewhat of a Cobra effect here? Don't you think some Darrow will go and get the vaccine 10 times and end up dying because they've got an overdose of this bloody thing in their system? It, it, it'll be like the civil <laughs> civil war when you'd pay people to um, enlist on your behalf. Well, no, the Cobra <laughs> effect. You know where that comes from, don't you? No, but oh, you're about to tell me. Very yeah, very quickly. Um, it, with, in in uh, colonial India, the British, there were too many snakes, so the British had a bounty on the number of snakes you breed in. So enterprising Indians started breeding these cobras and bring and killing them and bringing them in. And then when the when the, when they figured out what was happening, the, Brit the British cut the policy for understandable reasons. And all these snake breeders just let them loose into the population. So it made the po the product uh, problem even worse. So yeah, we could get people uh, anyway. I mean, it's a, it's a, I don't see that happening. Um, and I don't like uh, nudge, pro, I don't like nudge economics anyway. Right. I don't like the precedent it sets. I don't like giving people incentives paid for by the taxpayer to do things. I don't understand, and, and I, I know that there are complex epidemiological arguments for this. Um, but 
to me, if it's a vaccine vaccine and it protects you, then, um, you know, if you're really that scared of the coronavirus, go and get the bloody vaccine. If you want to take your chances, well, you know, it's a free country but and let's, your body, your choice. But let's go back, uh, Chris, and maybe you were going to touch on this, but we were talking off air. I mean, in with these coronaviruses and like Gideon, I claim no medical uh, expertise either but i can read english i can read sentences and some of the doctors have been kind enough to put their information into sentences that's the world first and um so for a start so morrison said he wants to do this early next year so the first thing we see is uk uh medical chief chris witty um says well late next year at best um but then what we've also got is like a range of efficacy um it's highly unlikely that the virus would be like a hundred percent effective um uh, because of the nature of it, and 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 some of, uh, and may well have side effects which are not fatal, which are not difficult, um, but it, they could make you sick, just as a flu vaccine occasionally makes you sick. Um, so this is, and the point about this is, we come back to scenarios. So if, as Chris Whitty says, you know, late next year as best, then. You can no longer plausibly say we are going to continue the way we have been operating for the last six months for the next 12 months um, uh, with still an uncertain, so it's almost um, uh, Bayesian, like with with a still uncertain outcome at the end. And this is why it's not just nut jobs, you know, uh, right wing nut jobs like me, which is what I get called on Facebook, who are saying this. You have people like uh, uh, Shatish Kapoor, the um, professor of med- or dean of medicine at at Melbourne University, saying that you know this is now the new normal, and this is what I meant by we're at a we're at a break point. Um, so if you haven't got the vaccine, um, and the break and the lockdowns are untenable to continue in this way, well then you need to start working to the new normal about actually managing a world where you have not managed to eliminate the virus, cannot manage to eliminate the virus. A vaccine's not here, so just start managing it and so if the dean of medicine at melbourne university is saying that what why is this escaping governments chris <laughs> um in part because um they've built up so much hope on this as well look i am i'm very optimistic and again you know i've, I've got no virological um skills that i'm aware of <laughs> um uh, uh but i am interested in it from a public policy perspective and there's a few really interesting um things that have been revealed by this um, first of all, you're right, there's been no coronavirus vaccine. We've got coronaviruses um, circulating in, um, um, amongst humans and have had for decades now, but we still don't have a vaccine. Now, part of that is because we haven't had an incentive to get a coronavirus vaccine. It's just, the common cold is nowhere near as harmful or certainly doesn't have the profile that the that COVID-19 does. Um, so we haven't massively invested in it. By contrast, now we are massively, when we as in human society, are massively investing in this. Um, we've already got two um, limited release of vaccines in the wild, so to speak, the um, famous or infamous Russian vaccine and another one in China that's being used on the Chinese military. But we've got another eight on in stage three trials, which is the stage just before um, uh, stage just before full release and approval, um, including the Oxford one and another one, um, an Australian one. Um, uh, coming from the Murdoch Children's Research Institute. Now, this is this is an incredible achievement by the scientific community to push these through because, mm. of, as we've said, it does usually take years. And certainly for most of the ones that are in the stage three trials, there's no suggestion that we've been slowing them down. There's no suggestion that, sorry, there's no suggestion that we've been cutting corners there's been a lot of big statements about um, how they're never going to cut corners. They're going to make sure it is really efficacious, which is super important, right, Gideon, to your point that, you know, we have to give this to people ultimately. We will ultimately end up giving it to people, say, who are in nursing homes. Mm. We'll give it to people who are in vulnerable situations. And we can't be in a situation where we get some crappy vaccine um, that causes really serious problems and then sets up a global anti-vaccination movement, we would be no better off mm. if, if we had that. So it's really, I, I think what we've done so far is really important. What I am worried about, though, in fact, very seriously worried about, is once we're at a um, clear winner in the race for a vaccine, how will regulators respond? 
Mm. Because it's not just about how we test these things, it's how we approve it. And um, the regulatory state has failed us terribly during this crisis. And if it slows <laughs> down the production and distribution of these vaccines, as it has in other fields, it will be catastrophic. Do you really think that that's that that's likely to happen, though, uh, Chris? I mean, the, the, the feds are so desperate for this, the, surely they'll lean on the regulators and just wave it through. So well, I absolutely do think it will happen. I'm not convinced it will happen in Australia, but it will absolutely happen in the United States. Yeah. It's very likely to happen. The, in the FDA United is is, is but, but terrible. The, but there's also so, so they have the, been to the either, problems yeah. that national regulators have had with really simple things like mask production and testing like um and testing production these these regulatory agencies can stuff up more than you could possibly imagine and they usually well, do I'm really worried about the well, FDA, one I'll, of the worst regulators yeah i'll throw i'll throw one in there um so i mean there's there's actually uh, either scenario is bad like you know uh appro- approval without sufficient scrutiny and, and public loses confidence or delay. But, you know, I would also throw into the mix with the FDA this uh, debacle we've seen over uh, hydroxychloroquine. Now... Um, Stole my bloody point, Scott. Yeah, Just and, about to raise that. and uh, highly commend uh, Craig Kelly uh, and his Facebook feed for being a clearinghouse for a lot of information about it. Again, I'm not going to make a ruling on whether I, th- I think the stuff works, but what... W- I, what I think is definitely clear is that off the back of one or two studies where uh, the drug was administered only to people who were very close to death mm. in uh, doses that were way beyond any any reasonable uh, measure that they're normally prescribed for yeah. uh, for normal uses, and lo and behold, people very close to death then died, mm. and it was re- reported that hydro uh, hydroxychloroquine was therefore uh, should not be used to treat COVID patients. So the FDA, like, bang, you know, yeah. uh, no one's allowed to prescribe it. Um, so uh, thankfully, further studies have been going on all over the world um, about earlier stage interventions at reasonable doses. In India, it's being used at mass scale. Mm. Um, once again, these regulators have not covered themselves in glory. No, that and that, as I said, that was the point I was going to make. I can't help but feel that we're focusing our attention in the wrong place here i think that we've we've spent too long obsessing over a vaccine and prevention when really we should be looking at treatment uh as i said before there has never been a cure for a coronavirus in the history of mankind but there are plenty of at least ostensibly feasible ways to treat this disease and i am so disgusted by how politicized hydroxychloroquine has been now i can't tell you if it's effective for it if it isn't you know i read things online i see you know not just nut job things but serious studies that say it is effective in early stages, as you said. I also speak to the specialists I visit, like every other Jewish hypochondriac, and they say, no, 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 there's no evidence it doesn't work. Not for political reasons, I mind that. They just shrug their shoulders and say, no, 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 that's, that's hogwash. The point I'm making is that it, 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 it feeds into our, the right to try and things like that. I can't, you know, it's one thing not to, not to advise or not to be gung-ho about these things, but to ban them and to withhold them. I have GPs who call me up doctor mates who call me up saying, you know, there, there is this uh, drug being put on the market in such and such and our people aren't even aware of it. How do I get it out there? The problem mm. is that the minute you talk about actually treating the coronavirus, it's like, it's almost to the to the coronavirus alarmists like you're suggesting, you're smashing the dream of eliminating it. Uh, mm. and, and, and defeating it, it's 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 almost like there's a white a, flag. There's, a, it's there's saying, only one viable scenario. Yeah, and that's to- we we can only beat the virus with total surrender, unconditional surrender. Uh, you know, we have we have how many billions of dollars have we given to the damn medical system in this country over the the course of years? I'd give thousands of dollars in tax and pay hundreds of dollars every month in bloody insurance premiums. I'm never going to use. Can't we use these hospital beds to treat people and just try to? Mm. Yeah, well, it's a different, and what we've seen is a divide between the and and again, Chris, I'm quoting, looking forward here. We have talked about this. It's the divide between the epidemiologists and the clinicians. Mm. I mean, the only tools that epidemiologists have in their armory is lockdown, which was you know something that they've adapted from small outbreaks in small towns, and for the first time in history in our bloody 10,000 years since we urbanised, they've tried it on entire populations of countries 
um, uh, and vaccines. These are the only things that epidemiologists have in their armory. And so, they're, and they're the ones who have the ears of government. Clinicians, on the other hand, to mm. Gideon's point, are people who actually treat the patient before them. And they're thinking, I wonder what would work. And, and as they so often do, they think, ah, well, there's this drug which I use um, for these symptoms for different illnesses, yeah. so completely different illness, but these symptoms that I am seeing, whether it be you know inflammations, uh, I believe one of the properties of um, of uh, hydroxychloroquine is is it's an anti-inflammatory, um, which reduces the risk of the um, uh, the flood into the lungs that we've we've seen, and re- and therefore ventilators, blah 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 blah. God, I'm really going off piste here. Um, yeah. Somebody's going to pull me up on this. But anyway, hey, tell you what, though. The, tell you what, Scott. Can I interrupt? Yeah, yeah. I, I, save I, me, Chris. I, save me from my um, my my diet. Well, can I admit to being really uncomfortable with this conversation? Yeah. Because um, I know nothing, nothing about the clinical effects of drugs. I know nothing about the um, capacity for different interventions to act on. COVID any more than I can read newspaper reports and read the abstracts of some journal articles. What I'm really worried about and what has been one of the most distressing things in the COVID-19 crisis is how it has managed to convert, or a lot of people have tried to convert, clinical interventions like hydroxychloroquine or a vaccine or masks into culture war items. Now, I'm not suggesting that that's what we're trying to do here. No, they started it. But, uh, no, no, you see, I, I'm i not sure that they started I don't know. I don't quite know who they is. But when you see... Chris, the only reason a, hydroxychloroquine has a black mark against its name is because Donald Trump uh, believes in it. That, but, that only Do- but why does Donald Trump believe... So, so, so my point is, so he gets up and, and uh, I mean, roll back to March or whenever this, this happened. He gets up on, on, um, uh, at the podium and says, no, th- there's this fantastic drug. That, um, and don't worry about COVID because there's this fantastic drug. It's going to be great. Great. Now, I'm paraphrasing terribly, <laughs> probably defamatorily. But, um, uh, and then there's a, cal- there's a culture war in response. But there's just, it's culture war back and forth, culture war back and forth. But- and I worry that we're not in a position as a political society to deal with something that doesn't bow down to culture wars. Chris, that, with- like, whether it works is not a political opinion. Chris, Chris, with, with with great respect, you're sounding a little bit like the Listen to the Experts Brigade. Politics is downstream <laughs> from culture, um, and and the coronavirus, rightly or wrongly, is the most important public policy issue in our lifetimes by, na- by by virtue of the fact that it affects every man, woman, and child on planet Earth in terms of their livelihoods, their lib- liberties, and yes, quite possibly even their health. These things will inev- inevitably erupt uh, into some sort of commentary or or, or 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 debate and 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 a lot of the time that takes on the features of what we call a culture war I mean these things are very heated because these affect people and when I see um, ostensibly viable treatments being written off out of hand because they just how happened to coincide with Donald Trump's personal views or musings in the briefing room then I, I'm sorry that is a culture war this is this is a cadre of well-heeled people with pieces of paper with their name on it you uh, telling ordinary people they can't be a part of this debate. They absolutely can and should and must. Uh, that doesn't mean that everybody is as qualified to speak as everybody else, but this is always... The, 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 the virtue of this issue means that some variety of so-called cultural wars is, is inevitable from this. I, I um, oh. No, I, I think you make a reasonable point, though, Chris. Um, um, and, and <laughs> Well, but it, it does need to be a debate, but uh, let's say masks was your other example. So I... I, I do agree that some of what you read in the other direction about masks um, is is getting you know way to the other end of the scale. Like as as I've said on this podcast, like any public policy rationale for making people wear masks um, uh, while they're walk, walk you know I, I had, so someone I know on Facebook um, uh, had been walking around um, uh, the, the the Princess Park. And for a moment, pulled their mask down below their nose because they were catching their breath. I do that all the and, time. And got yelled Probably at by an, by an ambo driving past. Oh. And it's like, you know, there's no one within 100 metres. I mean, you know, so that, that kind of BS that you see. But obviously then in a shopping centre, in a small enclosed space, these things make a lot more sense. And, and I too would prefer, Chris, that there was a less heated, less polarised... 
um, a space for public debate where that can take place. So I disagree. Other, other things being equal. I disagree. I think it needs to be more heated. People, we are, we are, we are seeing all manner of restrictions coming from the government that's getting off vaccines, but we're seeing all manner of restrictions that don't work, have no, don't even, don't even have any semblance of common sense, let alone epidemiological merit. Uh, unless people do get angry about this and push back, then this, then the government. You know, do you think this is the first state of emergency, the only state of emergency that will be declared now? Uh, for the next few decades, everything will become a state of emergency. But we're talking about the use of medical... What do you think of climate, climate we're, we're emergency we're, we're, talking, we're talking about the, the, the ability to, to harness cl um, uh, medical information. Yeah, and, no. and, one, and one of the things about the, the experts here, uh, I say, before before we get to, um, you know, <laughs> citizen, um, citizen epidemiologists, <laughs> um, uh, <laughs> the point I, I, you know, I was making about epidemiologists versus clinicians is that um, even within the bounds of trust the experts, which is what the, the ruling class has been, you know, hammering into us for the last 40 years as they attempt to control every aspect of our lives, is there are, there are only certain types of aspects who are being privileged in this debate. Um, I quoted, for example, the, uh, the Dean of Medicine at Melbourne University. Um, uh, uh, John Anderson interviewed Jay Bhattacharya, who's Professor of Medicine at Stanford University, questioning these lockdowns. You know, there are, there are actually refereed articles saying that lockdowns are not, um, uh, are neither, are just not efficacious for treating pandemics. You know, measures like masks, social distancing, hygiene are measures that work. But these aren't the studies that guide public policy. So I think even within that bubble of listen to the experts, what's, you know, we, we, how do you open that debate up, Chris? That's right. Look, so um, <laughs> we've got a lot more to talk about vaccines, bizarrely enough, um, uh, Scott. Uh, so I did want to just pivot a little bit. Um, uh, one of the really interesting challenges that there is going to be in getting a vaccine, um, uh, regardless of whether we think that is the end of the crisis, certainly it seems like policymakers think it will be the end of the crisis. And that's what we're running for is um, what I'm going to call vaccine nationalism or um, uh, or even just supply chain challenges mm. um, in the uh, China has been using its early stage development of vaccines already as a geopolitical tool to insist that um, uh, or to, to use it. If you support Chinese geopolitical goals, then you'll have access or earlier access to Chinese vaccines where obviously um we've cut a deal with the um for a british vaccine access to that but not every country will be able to do so um this on top so there's the geopolitical issues then there's the really practical supply chain issues and that how do we get not just 25 million um copy uh, uh, um doses of this vaccine to australians but you know 7 billion around the world. Um, Gideon, uh, d does this worry you? I think this is one of the big challenges that we're going to be talking about in coming months, if not the next year. How on earth, once we have a vaccine, are we going to get it to people and what funny games are going to be played as we try? Oh, you've stumped me. I must admit, I, I, I haven't thought too much about this particular element of the debate. I mean, my first instinct, I guess, is that I don't think we need to worry about the Chinese coming up with something that we need that they can withhold from us because whatever they have is probably stolen from the people at Oxford anyway or a, a cheap knockoff. Um, look... Tested on bats. I don't know. I mean, I, I, I mean, how hard would it be to reverse engineer a vaccine if, if one was created, which it probably, in my opinion, won't be? Um, well, look, so, so there's already... Different from I mean, there's the, a fun I mean, thing, and I'll have to dig it up for the show notes, but there is an open source vaccine effort. Yeah. So where, where you, a group of scientists are um, developing a vaccine, testing a vaccine that they are also literally listing the ingredients and recipe for on the internet. And that will um, be the vaccine is, that will which work. Which is an extraordinary um, and very uh, well. That will using, be the vaccine that will work. Are they that, using blockchain, Chris? <laughs> <laughs> um, no, it's, it's, I'm going to send them an email after this just to find out whether they're interested. It's, it's a good point you make, Chris, um, or an interesting scenario you paint. So just to, to wind back to Morrison, so in, in one sense, the logical thing to do for the next 12 months would be absolutely nothing. There's all these competing vaccines out there. The University of Queensland's in today's paper they're saying, oh, well, you know, we've, we've got one too. Um, in one sense, you would wait until you actually 
see what works. Um, you know, the least least number of people who died in the clinical trials for, for, you know, these dozens of drugs. So what Morrison and other governments are doing is is placing a bet essentially because what they want is the early access. They're, it's a, they're politically driven that uh, their worst case scenario is that there is some drug that's the winner out of all this process, but like only Americans are getting it or only Chinese are getting it or only the French are getting it. So they, they're writing these contracts, uh, in this case with Big Pharma, to say, yeah, yeah. To say if this works... Um, we want to license it from you and we'll probably get CSL in, in Melbourne to produce it in bulk. But it doesn't necessarily mean that the AstraZeneca one will be the winner out of this race. No, it, it's a weird weird choice, isn't it? And I think um, just rolling back to the compulsory question, we are we are having this debate about a vaccine that does not exist. Um, and Correct. so we don't know the profile of it. We don't know. <laughs> it doesn't exist, but it's going to be, be compulsory. Yeah, yeah. Um, but if you're the government, what else are you going to do, right? So you you, you have to start making the plans that in other areas it appears that they failed to do so you need to start making the plans for what the world looks like in january or in april next year when there may be massive demand for one of the vaccines we don't know which one um i i, I was looking around this actually this morning and the australian government is putting out a tender for information right now to um uh, any company involved in the pharmaceutical supply chain in australia to find out what they would need if they were going to suddenly ramp up production or distribution. the Because um, uh, it's not just about the vaccine, it's all about all the little ingredients that go into the vaccine. Mm. Um, it's also about distributing the vaccine. So with your indulgence, Scott, I'm gonna read you this fascinating, challenging problem. Um, uh, how do we get the vaccine around the world? Or how do we even just get it within Australia the head of Emirates Sky Cargo's pharmaceutical division has pointed out that <laughs> a going. typical freighter, a Boeing 777 freighter, can carry 1 million individual doses of vaccine. That means if we want to distribute vaccine to half the world's population, we would need 8,000 cargo planes, or at least 8,000 cargo plane flights. Now, uh, I, I don't oh, know how terrible. to judge this, <laughs> this, this assessment. Could do it. They're it, a great it, airline. What, what it's telling you is it's just an extraordinary <laughs> I've got, I've upgraded me logistical twice. challenge. Yeah. Um, look. Well, maybe we could. Um, yeah, maybe the U.S. Air Force. Look, but I mean, I'm saying all of this, Scott, just to clarify, so that when this turns out to be a thing, if it turns out to be a thing, then I'll be able to say that we spoke about this in August. That's <laughs> yes. what I was but I mean, this has been done. Prescience. This has been done before, though. Didn't we eliminate smallpox by distributing worldwide some sort of oral vaccine or something? Yeah. Of course, but we didn't try to do it in the space of months. Yeah, it took a right? while. Yeah, the the <laughs> difference. The difference that we're here is. Because certainly in Australia, we have decided to shut down our economy until it's ready. Yeah. Uh, so that's um, a big. Speaking of shutting down the economy, Chris. Um, okay. Well, this we're is, move on, are we? Sorry. We are going to move on. This is the, uh, the fear that's been unleashed by the casual announcement by the Victorian Premier, Daniel Andrews, that he would uh, seek a 12 month extension to his ability to make orders under state of emergency powers. Um, and it's certainly triggered some kind of a backlash, something to behold, and um, and part of it was out of a fear that uh, these powers would indeed be used to enforce a lockdown in perpetuity or until at least the aforementioned vaccine becomes available. What happened That's there, right. Chris? So um, Daniel Andrews announced that he was planning to expand the state of emergency. Remember that we are in Victoria in a state of disaster, but the state of emergency is the one we're, just before that. We're, we're still in an emergency, but we're also an yeah. emergency and a disaster right now. Um, for another 12 months, extraordinary backlash from that, including um, within the Labor Party as well, but certainly across um, the political spectrum. Um, Gideon, I want to talk to you a little bit about this because um, uh, I, I know you've got lots of views on mm. it, but I, I want to present the best case argument for this, and I'd like you to respond to yeah. that. Um, so the state of emergency, as I understand, and please correct me if I get this wrong, state of emergency gives the public health officials the ability to um, make an order. And that order, as um, uh, the, the chief public health official, Brett Sutton, um, said, would, would be something like, well, you can't have more than 50 people go to a pub. So if we didn't have the state of emergency and we didn't have that legal regime, the um, public health officials would not be able to make quick, fast orders 
to say shut down a nightclub or shut down a business or require a business to do a certain type of COVID safe activity instead. Um, that's the argument for, uh, I, as, as far as I can see, that's the best case argument for it. And I'd like you to respond to that claim. Okay, so I think first we have to go back to first principles and ask what states of emergency are for. Now, even me, even I will accept that there has to be some scope for governments to act quickly in a genuine crisis to marshal government agencies to uh, mitigate genuine emergencies and genuine disasters, but they should be short term, they should be time limited. It should not be an emergency that spans a year or two um, years. Uh, I think there's, it's, a, it's a red herring to say that, well, if there wasn't a state of emergency, we couldn't do anything about it. The government could easily set up some sort of statutory authority that could make delegated legislation that is subject to disallowance motions by the parliament, as we do with Vic Roads, as we do with the Civil Administration Safety Authority, as we do with every other... This is what we This is what we have a massive regulatory state. Correct, but at, at, the, but at least... I know, and I don't, I'm not a yeah. fan of all those, all those bodies either. Um, mm. But at least the Senate, in the case of a federal agency, can disallow delegated legislations that our elected representatives deem un... Uh, that the, the deem the, their constituents don't want it can be shelved. Um, this is normalising a situation in which somebody like Brett Sutton, who firstly of all is complete, I think is completely out of his depth anyway, uh, but secondly, uh, nobody elected to continue making these orders probably in perpetuity. The other problem with this though, Chris, is that even if you take the government at its word, even if you say this is insurance policy, it won't be used, I don't believe that for a second, but Fundamentally, we know now the Andrews government has formed. They have systematically abused all of their powers they have given themselves since March. They have locked up our most vulnerable citizens in public housing towers and fed them rations like prisoners. Um, they've ruined thousands of lives. I, mean, I don't want to get into the, the, sort of the usual talking points here, but th this is how it starts. This is how authoritarianism starts. I'm sure there will people, be people all over the internet who'll say, oh my God, you're, you're overreacting, you're spinning conspiracy theories and so on. But uh, the great majority of the descents into authoritarianism that we have seen uh, from the Reichstag fire on have been precipitated by various emergencies that the government purports to need to move quickly on. And as I said over and over again, this will not be the last time the government will use these powers. They've been popular, according to the polls. I don't think they have been in real real life, as I've said, but they've, they've, been, they've been popular electorally. They've given uh, leaders this statesman-like veneer and aura of invincibility. You know, what does everybody think a climate emergency looks like? That... <laughs> we, 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 well, we, we, yeah, I, I, I come from a slightly different starting point, which is... Um, there is this tension between emergency powers and and democracy, mm. and but that that's why we have this legislation in in place. And and that's I, why it's time limited, and that's why it's time limited. I mean, you know, government going going back to Roman times. I mean, the original um, uh, term um, uh, dictator, I think, goes back to Roman times when when they would suspend their normal operations and actually appoint a, a dictator for a, t a time mm. limited. Um, uh, I think it was uh, 10 years to get put things in order and then they'd walk away. Um, in this case, it's like up to a maximum of six months. And But I come back to the point, so it's not unreasonable that, that that's what we've done. Um, but it is unreasonable to say that you would continue that in perpetuity because then the balance between the democratic aspects and as you say, the power was abused. I mean, so when Parliament couldn't even scrutinise decisions post facto, when the Minister for Health refuses to answer questions in Parliament, when Parliament can't, uh, the lower house of the Victorian Parliament can't sit, mm. then, you know, that, that, that um, I guess, trust that we've placed in decision makers through the state of emergency powers has been broken. And it just comes back to my fundamental point is it's time to say we are in, we're at an inflection point. It's time for a new way of management. Clearly, the chief medical officer does need some powers to make some kind of orders during this crisis. I mean, Daniel Andrews says, well, it's, you know, it's about face masks and things. So yes, there could be regimes, but to simply announce that, no, 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 the simplest thing is we'll just continue with untrammeled powers for the next 12 months is not to recognise that an you can cannot have a, an emergency, and I'm doing that air quote thing for anyone listening on podcasts, you cannot have an emergency that goes for 18 months. 
No, and, and, and it's madness. And the face masks thing is the most obscene. They can just pass a, pass a face mask act. Correct. If they want to do so, mm. we have a legislature that allows them to do various things. It goes back to a point that I've made a number of times in recent weeks. Um, we are not in March anymore. Mm. We are not suddenly surprised by the existence of a new virus in a community that we do not understand and we have no idea about the effects. We know what stage three and four and two, we know what they look like. We can we can legislate these things. If we, if we have to live with this until July or, or whenever it is, this is, this is the time to sit down in Parliament and pass the legislation that maintains democratic legitimacy over these decisions. Not all of them are illegitimate decisions, but until they are considered by parliament, unfortunately, they are democratically illegitimate. Um, and the government, it, 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 is, it is shocking that the government doesn't understand this. Uh, what I am very heartened by, though, is the um, knowledge that a lot of people across the political spectrum are deeply, deeply uncomfortable with this from people on the Greens, from Labour people, um, even casual Labour voters that I've been speaking with yeah. um, are really, really unhappy about this. They know this is one step too far. Hopefully um, in the next couple of days, we'll learn that Daniel Andrews is backing down from it um, because there've been some intimations. I know this morning we're recording on Wednesday, of course, some intimations that there are regrets within the government about this approach, but it does, it does go to show claim. that Luckily, the political system has only so much tolerance um, for this sort of anti-democratic action. And um, uh, and again, the, the politics of this are not like they were in March. Well, I, I think the political system has too much tolerance for this, to be perfectly honest with you. People should be marching the street. And I'm not encouraging anybody to break the law. I'm not encouraging anybody to actually <laughs> do that. But when you look at what's happening in other countries in response to their second lockdowns and so on, uh, we, we're rolling over. I think people's patience is running out. But, jeez, we've, yeah. we've copped a lot. I actually have a theory on that. I have a theory on that, Gideon. And and as, as Chris said, there has been a remarkable backlash, a heartening backlash to this. But what I think that's proved is that the... The acquiescence that we've seen um, over the past few months, the, the the lack of agitation, if if you like, I mean, well, apart from the fact that you can get arrested even for threatening to protest, you, <laughs> your home can be invaded um, in the absence of a habeas corpus writ. Um, uh, the, my theory on this is that what it just proves that what we've actually seen is sullen acqu acquiescence, because politics rev generally revolves around decisions. We have a two-party system in which people get the opportunity um, to argue the merits of various um, courses of action being proposed and through legislation in a parliamentary system, um, people can express views which influence legislators, which influence ultimately the outcome. And so what we've had in this period of acquiescence is not true acquiescence as in, you know, forget the, the you know, the Dan Boy BS that you see yeah, on fa 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 Facebook, you know, the, 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 the paid boosters of, of, of the ALP. I'm talking about most people are just like, well, I can't do anything. I can't influence this. There is no legislation to be debated. And, and so um, this is, I think, much of what's led to despair. Mm. And there's real despair in the Victorian community. And part of it is the feeling of absolute helplessness. So we've seen this from, from small business, from individuals, um, from people who've been, um, who, who've been fired. Um, they may not have access to JobKeeper. So hopelessness leads to despair. This is the first time, simply because of that six-month time limit on the Act, that suddenly there's a decision to be made. And the upper house, that thing that uh, the Jacobins never like, this, this, re this, this final check on their power elected under a different franchise, um, mm. actually has a bloody role to play and, mm. and we'll see what the, the cross branch does. But that's why I think it's, it, it's like um, uncorking a, a bottle under pressure, Chris, because people have n not until now actually had the opportunity to participate in a true political debate. I think it's incumbent on us once this crisis is over, once um, uh, democratic legitimacy is restored, that we insist on learning the lessons of the crisis that we insist on revising public health statutes, that we don't give the government the capacity to extend uh, at, at, at their own, on their own behest for 12 months a state of emergency. Um, we can change that in statute and governments 
we'll have to change that in statute. It'll be very easy for us once the crisis is over, if everybody's vaccinated, there's full herd immunity and COVID is either eliminated or just just like the common cold. It'll be easy to, to forget and it'll be easy to try to move on because we all want to go back to debating taxation and <laughs> technology and all this Nanny sort of stuff state. That, that is great that is great fun and we we're much more in our comfort zone about but it will be time then for us to insist on changes because these are legislative frameworks that have been poorly scrutinized before the crisis and we're now learning what that poor scrutinization actually means. Yeah, and Chris, I hope, uh, my great hope and my one cause for optimism in all of this is that this will show once and for all that uh, what a few of us call big public health, the public health expertocracy has no idea what the hell they're talking about. Those villains that I've railed against my entire adult life, hopefully, will get what's coming for them. And I get my cigars back, and I get my solariums back, <laughs> and I get my cheap beer back, and I get my higher speed limits back, and I get every one of life's simple pleasures. Oh, and I get, oh, and my vapes, I hope they back the hell away from taking away my vapes. I hope that I get every one of life's simple pleasures that has been systematically denied to me by the big government and big public health my entire adult life back. Uh, this is just a, a dramatic exclamation point on the tyranny of the self-proclaimed experts and the power that they've held over our lives for decades now, and it's got to stop. That was the sound grab you, you were born to make. Thank you for coming for my TED Talk. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> yes, the IPA with you uh, broadcasting uh, tomorrow. Yes, correct. <laughs> yeah, uh, thank, you, thank you, Gideon. And uh, from the heart, definitely got skin in the game yeah. there. Um, well, it gets me fired up like uh, you know booze and uh, food policy. <laughs> Very good. Uh, we have come to that part of the show, Chris, I think, where we talk uh, books and culture, um, what we've been reading, watching and listening to because we can't stay in this heightened state of agitation all the time. What have you been looking at, Chris? So I don't know whether to put this in culture or um, something, but I have been playing a computer game. Um, we every once in a while do computer games on this show. I've been playing Microsoft Flight Simulator 2020, which was released about a week ago or something. Um, it is an extraordinary uh, technological achievement. For those who are not familiar with Flight Simulator, um, which is one of the older historical Microsoft properties, Flight Simulator is exactly what it says. You fly a plane, you don't fight that plane, you don't do anything but take off and land and just fly around as you see fit. Some pilots have used it for training purposes because um, it's very focused on high realism. Um, in, uh, so, so anyway, that's the, that's the product. This particular product, though, has the entire planet on it. You can fly anywhere in the globe from um, uh, the Eiffel Tower to your house to the middle of the South Pacific Ocean. You can go anywhere you want in incredibly high quality um, uh, depiction. Because what, what they've done is they took Microsoft, the Bing map service, they paired it, which which is pretty good, not as good as Google Maps in my view, but nonetheless, they paired it with a AI company that then built out physical 3D representations of the houses that Bing maps depicted. So you're flying through a three-dimensional world with real, or real depictions of buildings. It's not 100%, obviously, every single building um, is accurately depicted, but depictions of buildings. So you fly through a toy world and the entire planet. Now, what do you do when you do this? I listen to podcasts um, huh. and you just go for a fun flight. It's incredibly relaxing. Cool. And um, it's, it's great fun. It's a killer. It, it'll destroy your, your PC. It's very demanding on uh, I, I have it on pc it's very demanding but it is just incredible fun now uh, i'll describe this in the saddest way i can possibly do so scott <laughs> you know that i used to do a lot of travel <laughs> around yeah. the world. Oh. this is the perfect COVID game to make me feel sad mm. um because you can go to all the places that you had planned to go <laughs> in august 2020 um does, and does, does someone you, you know theme. does someone come <laughs> along with a trolley and offer you a drink i was about to say they should, they should do flight simulator for the passengers <laughs> um, first class but, but it is yeah. it is it is just an extraordinary technological achievement it is a um a, an extraordinary experience because of the quality of that achievement 
Um, and it's just a, a really fun thing to do. You may not think it is fun to fly for an hour between I don't know, <laughs> Melbourne and Sydney, which of course we can't do right now. Um, uh, but but it is it is extraordinary, and I really encourage you if you've got a computer that can do it, Chris, um, um, uh, to pick it up and have a go. Chris, I can't say I've ever attempted to fly a, an A three eighty or something, but I, I can't imagine it being a particularly easy thing to do. If no, the game's so hyper realistic, I'm, well, I'm, I'm, well, I'm not if, very good at this game. Well, that's well, that's my question. I mean, I'd imagine if the game's hyper realistic, wouldn't it be a little bit frustrating to play if you can't even get these machines off the ground in real life? Oh well, so it teaches you, so it'll teach you how to play, and you can play a variety of planes. Okay. So, uh, like a little Cessna, oh, okay. like a Cessna one five two, which is the beginning plane, and there's there's a dozen or so plane options. Um, so, so you can just, and of course, you wouldn't be able to see your house, right, if you're in a seven four seven, yeah, um, oh, uh, okay. going going very fast. So you can you can have these little stunt planes, all that sort of thing. It, it is it is just get in, you'll love it. Yeah, I'm sure um, I will. So, but you're telling me you're telling me it teaches you. So, one of the all these tutorials you have to get through before you can actually play yeah. the thing. Oh, well, I always lose, oh, yeah, yeah. lose interest before I'm done with the tutorials. So, but no, it's quite it's quite clever in that they make it easy to like you can switch off lots of features so that it's less realistic, so that's not as hard to fly and all that sort of thing. So, all right, excellent. So, look, it's it's designed even for people like yourself. Excellent. Well, so uh, you've given me a, a brand new way to procrastinate. So, uh, my head goes off to you. <laughs> it is Chris. terrible. Yeah, I might go next, Chris, because I see Gideon has an actual book. So. He's he's going to be the, he's going to be the winner out of this segment. Um, I just wanted to briefly mention um, for uh, many listeners will be familiar with uh, John Anderson's uh, podcast series um, or their video, so you can find it on YouTube. Conversations with with John Anderson. Uh, you were talking before about um, uh, uh, being worried about politicisation of all issues, and uh, John Anderson, uh, former deputy prime minister, leader of the National Party. Um, uh, that's the sort of the avowed um, aim of his series, which is to have it as conversations to to um, uh, take the temperature down a little bit on political debates to uh, get back to some sort of idea of public policy formulation, which is a little bit more genteel, a little bit more polite, the sort of thing that he felt uh, that he was uh, was more in tune with his era when he was with the Howard government. I must admit, I. I don't listen to it that often because, you know, it, it seems out of sync at, with the times, but I do admire the effort. It's also a beautifully produced series. Um, even when, you know, guests are remote, uh, I think the, the visuals are always really good. And um, why it came to my attention recently was, um, uh, I'm cheating here, Chris, it was um, uh, about COVID-19. It was He was interviewing uh, Professor Jay Bhattacharya, um, from Stanford University, who is also uh, a, a professor of medicine but also an economist. So he's essentially a, a health economist. And they had a perfectly rational conversation about um, trade-offs, the fact that you have to be able to think in terms of trade-offs, um, about whether a vaccine could be, um, uh, could be possible, uh, the costs of, of lockdowns, as um, this professor of medicine pointed out, everyone says, oh, it's, it's lives versus economy. And he's like, well, no, it's not, because there are lives on both sides of the equation, actual lives, not, not economic lives, but uh, increased suicides, um, the increase in mortality from other preventable diseases because people aren't being checked, um, and, and even uh, perversely, I believe, uh, rates of immunisation are down because people are avoiding um, clinics and hospitals. Um, so anyway, a very good uh, discussion, which I commend to everyone, uh, particularly if they just uh, want to find an expert who's actually talking some common sense. And um, and I commend the series to anyone who just wants to uh, hear some, you know, uh, I guess a sense of what politics uh, could be like, if you like, uh, a more utopian idea of politics. I think he tried to be a statesman-like when he was in office, uh, not always easy, but he's certainly doing it in his post-political life, and I commend him for it. Oh, he's a class act, an absolute class act, John Anderson. Yeah, 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 yeah no, no, really, really good. So I'll link to that in the um, in the show notes, of course. But. Excellent. So um, this is uh, I, I'm brought in the mandibles by Lionel Shriver. I uh, intended to talk about it last time I was on this show, but then I thought it was a bit too lowbrow, so I went with Kath and Kim instead. Um, but this is the most important novel of the 21st century that I've read anyway, and uh, one of 
my favourite books of all time now. Uh, basically, it's a near future dystopian novel set in beginning, set between the years 1929 and 2047. It envisions a 20, 20, 2029. 20, sorry, 2029 and 2047. Yeah. So set nine years from now. It was written in 2016. But it basically envisions a scenario in which the US uh, accumulates so much debt that it can't pay it back and ends up defaulting on it. And then the world oh, moves. That, oh, that was, gee. Oh, ho- Crazy ideas, you know. <laughs> Correct. It, uh, well, I'll, I'll get to that in a minute. <laughs> anyway, basically, the rest of the world gets it in for the US and uh, ditches the US dollar as the reserve currency and moves to a new supranational currency called the Bancor. As a result, the US dollar loses its value overnight. The government confiscates all gold. Uh, it, the the uh, big cities descend into completely lawless, anar- anarchic societies. Uh, and uh, what it, what's important, though, is... Well, firstly, it's so brilliantly written. I mean, Shriver weaves together... A, a compelling human story, social commentary, philosophy, and really insightful economic discussion as well, particularly about monetary policy. I never thought I would see a novel a novel illustrate no monetary policy in such a a, 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 a compelling way. But it also um, to, it, it's 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 a twenty first century Atlas Shrugged. It talks about what money means, what wealth means, the meaning of wealth, the the importance of of money um, as, a, as a means of exchange and a means of societal cohesion. And I don't want to give away the ending, but the ending is hauntingly similar to Atlas Shrugged as well. I read this probably a few months back during the first lockdown, and I, find it so, I found it so hauntingly realistic that I genuinely had trouble distinguishing it from reality. My, my worries about the COVID situation and the debt situation with Australia were often conflated with my worries about what the characters were going through in this book. And it it absolutely is a sobering wake-up call for anybody who has any faith at all in central banks or fiat currency. And Chris, that explains why a few weeks ago I texted you asking me for financial advice over which, about which cryptocurrencies I should invest in because that's my new hobby slash, slash life round. Which, of course, which of course I cannot offer any financial advice. <laughs> no, no, and I, and I know tax affairs are complicated. I need to consult my financial advisor and everybody's circumstances are different. But apart um, from that, which coin should I buy? Yeah, yeah, but apart from that, you know, <laughs> shut up and tell me how to divert my money into into crypto. Um, look, this is a very, very important book, as I said. I think anybody with any interest in public policy whatsoever needs to read it. Shriver is a magnificent author and importantly as well, it makes some monetary policy very, very important and very, very relevant to everyone. And it is particularly important because we are seeing the horrifying rise of modern monetary theory. And for anybody that think that thinks that voodoo garbage has any utility whatsoever in a public policy sense, needs to read this book. That's terrific. Five stars. Thank you, Gideon. Um, I've only known Lionel Shriver from her social commentary. Um, well, I which, saw her when she was in Melbourne, and but I didn't but, read this in time. But never actually read a novel, so that's a terrific recommendation. And question without notice, would you write a review for us? Yes, I will, actually. IPA review. I'd be delighted, yeah. That, that would be wonderful. Um, when um, I finish the first article, I promise you. <laughs> yeah, um, I'm hoping IPA listeners uh, right now are looking at the current edition of the review, which is the winter edition. Uh, copies have been delivered to uh, every state of Australia except Victoria, where it was actually printed. Go figure. Yeah. It tells you something about what's going on no, in I'd Victoria. Like, I'd, I'd like to give you a bit of a, a pump up your tyres and say it was a very good edition, but unfortunately I haven't received it yet, but yeah. I'm sure it will be an excellent edition as uh, well. I have a friend in Washington, D.C., who got his edition before... Uh, well, I'm still waiting for mine at my residential address. Uh, but it is a terrific edition of the IPA review, and uh, so that's the winter edition, and then you will give me something on Lionel Shriver for the... Um, Spring edition. Correct. Thank you so much, Gideon. And, um, uh, of course, if you want to get the IPA review, uh, go to ipa.org.au uh, and join the IPA and you'll get it four times a year. You've been listening to Looking Forward, which is a product of the Institute of Public Affairs. And uh, I'll wave goodbye to my co-host, Chris Berg. <laughs> thank you, Scott, from a distance. Yep. No, thank you, Chris. And um, Gideon, it's good to have you on a, a suitably socially distant uh, way on the podcast. And all yeah, the I best. Won't, I won't give you a hug afterwards. No, of course not. And, uh, well, wouldn't do that anyway. I mean, 
there's some things about social distancing I'm completely comfortable yeah. with. Um, uh, and good luck with your podcast, thank you. uh, the IPA, uh, with you. And, and thank you, for, as always, for having me on. I think this is one of my favourite gigs coming on this program. I, I love the discussion. It's, uh, it's, it just flies by. Very good. Okay. Thanks. We'll be back with more next week.